All right, so tonight we have the comparison of counseling models. Another way to say that, and what the, the manual says it, your self-confrontation manual, is God's way versus man's way, to say it simply. Everyone can observe that, that mankind does have problems. That's, that's obvious. Everyone ob- can observe that we all need to change. Um, but when it comes to identifying the problem and the solution to the problem, God's way and man's way are in sharp contrast. And that's what we hope to show this evening. I want to introduce the topic by going to your manual. So can you guys open up in your manual to page 64? We're going to look at it together. Uh, A couple things here, and then we can put our manuals away so you can manage all the things on your lap. So in your self-confrontation manual, page 64, I'm going to read it several things. In the box at the top of that page, it says, Man, in his own wisdom has developed a vast number of philosophies and theories seeking to explain one's thoughts, words, and actions. In doing so, man has pridefully sought to deny his own sinfulness and has confused any clear definition of God's standards of right and wrong. That blame shifting of denying sinfulness and blaming other people started way back in the garden, continues today. So the purpose of this lesson is A, to contrast man's philosophies of life with God's truth for living. B, to illustrate the folly and confusion of this world's wisdom in solving problems as compared to the certainty of God's plan for overcoming any difficulty in life. And C, to evaluate biblically the differences between man's way and God's way. We're going to focus on those. Letter D, just to finish it out, says, to give you further opportunity to prepare your own testimony of God's grace and mercy and to demonstrate your own commitment to follow God's way. That letter D is for those of you that are doing homework, but come to page 65. In the box, God's word clearly shows that man's way of living is futile. Man has very serious shortcomings that he cannot change by himself. Look at the principles underneath there. Principle seven, you cannot live according to God's design in your own way or by your own wisdom. The natural man is rebellious. The natural man is self-centered and rebels against God's way. Furthermore, partial obedience to God is just as unacceptable to him as even your deliberate rebellion. Therefore, man needs to be changed. It's necessary to be born again, to be born from above, to have a spiritual rebirth in order to recognize, admit, and solve your problems in a biblical manner. Only God's solutions, grace, empowering, and wisdom are completely adequate for abundant living. And then lastly, on the next page, God's word is the only true source of th- and authority for living. It reveals man's failure, the subsequent consequences, and the effect that man's original sin has on today's world. So that's the manual introducing the topic. Let's go to your word, to the word of God. Um, Colossians Let's start in Colossians chapter 1. This is all by way of introduction. While you turn into Colossians 1, let me give you a caveat. When we're talking about God's word being sufficient to solve man's problems, I'll just remind you again, we are not talking about God's word as a replacement for medicine. Okay, so that's not what we mean. Sometimes that can be misunderstood. But we at North Creek, as well as biblical counseling as a whole, recognize that there are legitimate illnesses that do require medicine. So when we say it's sufficient, we're not talking about sufficient for physiological problems. Now, the inner man does have an effect on the outer man and vice versa. But I just don't want you to think that we're talking about a holistic type of sufficiency that means you don't need to take meds, get off all your meds, and just just read your Bible. There are physical illnesses that you should be taking you should be taking meds for those so that's not what we're talking about this entire evening matt rare dr matt rare who's on staff here will be talking about that uh very soon in march that's not that's not soon he's talking about it in march okay we're in october so when we talk about depression uh he has an entire lesson that's devoted to biblical counseling and medicine so that that's coming If you want more information on that type of dynamic, you can go to nctconference.org. We have several on there regarding medicine. Matt actually just did one for the conference there. 
So Colossians 1, though. In Colossians 1, 15, Paul, when speaking of Jesus, says that he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and what? For him. That's important. All this is important, but that's especially important for tonight. He is before all things, verse 17. And in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might also, that he might be preeminent. It goes on. Well, let's finish it. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So in those verses, we read that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, right, to restore order on the earth and to bring reconciliation between sinful mankind and God. Jesus holds all authority and he sits supremely over all things, including me and you. That's 15 to 20. Look at chapter 2, verse 4. Paul says, I say this, that is all the things he set up to this point in the book. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. What plausible arguments? Well, he starts getting to that and let's go to verse eight and get right to it. See to it that no one takes you captive with these plausible arguments. No one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. Do you see how all the things that were listed in verse 8 are all set in opposition to Christ? Do you see that? There's a a number of things listed, but there's only two sides, right? No one takes you captive by, on this side, philosophy, empty deceit, according to human tradition, and according to elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. He's not talking about a spectrum. He's talking about you have man's way and you have God's way. Make sure nobody takes you captive by going man's way. That's basically what he's saying right there. He's saying, make sure that you are not taken away by these arguments or led astray. So they're not merged in any way. So we could say it this way. The, exclus- the exclusivity of Christ and the gospel as the solution to our messed up lives over and above man's way is all over the Bible. This is just one example. But we have the tendency, even in our world today, to get caught up in man-made tradition. Sometimes we know it, sometimes we don't. Usually it sounds pretty pleasing to our flesh, so we like it. But we get swept up, and this is the reminder from the Bible, don't get swept up by man's way. So at the foundation of man-made theories is an opposition to God. That's another way of saying what this passage is talking about. At the foundation of man-made theories is opposition to God. In other words, man exalting himself as supreme. That's why we say there's two options on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. Who's preeminent according to this passage? Christ is preeminent. First place in all things. And you say, make sure no one takes you captive by scooting Christ off that preeminent throne. And what we're going to find in all these man-made philosophies puts who on the throne? Me. Man. So it's man's way versus God's way. Now, I understand that this is a tough lesson for a lot of people. Some people are paying to put their kids into school, um, or you have perhaps paid for school or been to a school or been trained in this way um, in terms of philosophies, psychology. This is uh, a lesson that is sometimes polarizing for people. But I hope that you see, and especially as I present it here, that this is not me intending to step on toes. This is me attempting to present and to be accurate, though from a high level, all the different man-made philosophies, the different psychologies that are out there, um, and to show God's way and that they're in opposition to each other. Now, in a room this size, there's a lot of people that have gone to a psychologist, sometimes a Christian psychologist, whatever. So, This is not a theoretical topic. This is something that's usually live with things in the room. But what I'm asking you at the outset is to take whatever I'm talking about and you do your best to be a Berean and look at scripture and say, is what he is saying true? 
Does this philosophy line up with the word of God? So search the Bible on what I'm saying here. All right, but we got a lot of ground to cover here. Why study secular counseling models? We say, well, one, because our society is permeated with philosophies that come from the field of psychology. Undergirded, this is important, undergirded by worldviews that are antithetical to Christianity. It is helpful for us to understand the nature of these beliefs so that we can be informed witnesses to the world. So from formal counseling, formal therapy, to hospitals, to fitness, to ads, to social media, all that stuff, it has permeated our society. It's even in politics. So psychology, the study of the mind, has permeated our society. And just think about like the, the most recent mass shooting or an assassination attempt. Who's at fault? The shooter, the gun, the parents, the school, the bullying. What's the problem? Why is our society like this? Why do these keep happening? What's the problem? What's the solution? The answers are all over the place. That's a theological exercise on how you answer that, though. Your theology is at stake, what you believe about God. Your anthropology is at stake, what you believe about man. Your homartiology, what you believe about sin. Soteriology, what you believe about salvation and even into sanctification. There's more, but these are theological disciplines. Uh, this is a theological exercise when we answer the question, what's the problem and what's the solution? So when someone comes, because there's so many psychologies out there, there's like 200 or I don't know what the number is. It depends because people will mix and match. There's so many out there. If someone says, hey, I have a psychology degree or I'm a psychologist, that doesn't really tell you a whole lot because you don't know to, like in what school of thought and which one do you like and which one are you pulling from? Two psychologists can and often do have completely different worldviews. So even though we're saying it's Christ versus the world, once you're out in the world, even those worldviews differ, and we're going to walk through those. So that's the first one. It's permeated our society. We also want to study it because many pastors, Christian counselors, which we'll define later, and believers either knowingly or unknowingly accept the beliefs of psychology as true. It's important for us to be able to recognize the false teachings and psychology when they are presented and discern truth from error. First John 4 is mentioned in the reference there. It's similar to Colossians 2.8, which we looked at, but the Holy Spirit through John attributes these types of false teachings to Satan, actually calls them demonic. That's not a popular thing to say, but there's no middle ground. Now, okay, I'm not talking about personal salvation you know, with the individuals that hold these particular views. I'm not talking about their heart, not talking about their motivation or their intelligence. I'm talking about the core beliefs or their worldview, um, their view of God, man, sin, salvation. That's what we're analyzing here tonight. Again, how people change is a theological exercise. So secular counseling is what we want to talk about right now, or just called secular psychology. Now, you guys have an appendix in there, appendix B, the chart. Can you pull out the chart? We're going to be at this for a little while. So get that chart in front of you. and You can see there, I think it says at the bottom, what page is it? 22, 22 page 22. I merged um, page 74 from the self-confrontation manual and some of the things that I got from seminary and then a couple of wording changes that I thought were clear on my own. And so this is not entirely mine, um, but these are the basic, the, the four basic schools of thought or the categories of psychology that have, that have come on the scene really in the, the 1900s, in the in 20th century, we could say. So we're going we're gonna to walk through them. It's going to take me a little bit to introduce them, so I'm gonna, it's going to take me a while to go through this first column. So I don't know how, you might just want to just sit back and listen. I don't know how you're going to take notes on this, but what I want you to do is to think about, we're going to line all these up. You can see it on the, on the handout. We're going to line them all up and we're just going to compare the secular psychologies to God's way, man's way versus God's way. But you have it broken down into four different categories um, based on the different 
psychological views. Okay, so that first one that you can see there is instinctual. Now, by the way, I'm not an expert in these categories, okay? So if you're like, oh, I don't think that you accurately represented the instinctual model. Okay, fine, come find me afterwards and I'll try my best next time to better represent it. However, that's not what really what we're after. I'm after and I want you to be thinking about their model, their worldview in these categories and how does it compare to God's way? So I'm happy to be corrected on how I'm presenting them but more so I'm interested in you going back if you have an issue with one of these that to go back and to go look and see like does this is, is what he's saying true does it really is that is this really what they believe about man for example so I'm trying to give you an overview now the first category again is the instinctual category this is uh of course Freud this is probably the the most common name that that you would know in this room this is um he, he came on the scene he was born in the 1800s but yeah uh, became popular in the 1900s when he wrote his paper about the id, the ego, and the superego, right? You guys remember learning this in school? Um, Freud was a God-hating atheist, which ought to be a little bit of a flag right off the bat there. Um, he's the one that championed psychoanalysis. He's, he did coin the terms id, ego, and superego. So uh, just remember your psychology class back from school. You just picture the shoulders, right? You have the id, which is like the, it's the, the demon side, you know, it's like the devil. Um, and that's just like your passions, your raw passions. I, and he, Freud was very sexual. So it's like, I want sex. I want this. It's all your needs and that they're not your needs, but your desires and your wants, what, what you want. Okay. So that's, that's your unconscious. It's just, you don't have, it's just what you want. You don't have to ask for it. It's just what you want. On the other side would be the super ego. And that is, uh, what he would say, well, we would call it the conscience. It's just like your moral compass. It's your sense of right and wrong. And his premise was that your ego is the part of you that is determining which of these you should do. Okay, so that's, that's my brief review of the id, the ego, and the superego. But the point is that, that his premise was that you and I are instinctual creatures and a very sexual creature wanting to express itself but other things have shaped our superego, our conscience, our moral compass. And then therefore we're making a determination about what is right or wrong. So we have these internal desires that want to get out, but we have something that's hindering us. And what it is that is, what, what that has been shaped by is your parents, typically, and your upbringing. Okay, so that's, I'm going to say more about it, but that's just a little introduction into that particular category, the instinctual category. You're just an instinctual being. The behavioral psychology category, so Skinner, you can see it, Skinner, Pavlov, Watson in that category. So they rejected Freud because he emphasized the individual and they said things like concepts like the mind, attitude, and dignity should be eliminated. So generally speaking, this category believes that we don't have a human nature, but rather we're just animals reacting to nature. So therefore, they said if we're nothing different than an animal, they're going to study animals. So lab rats and things like that and dogs, right? That's Pavlov's dog. You know about that, right? Okay, so if we are just reduced just to animals, then why not study animals? So that was their approach. They attempted a scientific approach, which only behavior can really be analyzed. You can't get to the heart and analyze that in a scientific way, why you did what you did. That's subjective. So you can't scientifically analyze the heart. Now, Pavlov, like I said, is known for his dog. It's classical conditioning. If you recall, um, he had a more of a major emphasis on the involuntary. And as, and by contrast, Skinner was the one that emphasized a little bit more voluntary. Skinner emphasized rewards and punishments. But their conclusion is, was this. Agents outside you have trained you to do what you do. So they gave very little emphasis on your free will little emphasis on your choices. What you need to do is just restructure your environment. You are the way you are because of your environment around you. Now, there are branches to each of these, okay? So as soon as I say, well, I don't know that they all believe that. Well, they didn't all believe that exactly, but they fit into this particular category. Now, a little caveat, and you have to listen carefully. CBT falls in this category. What's CBT? Cognitive Behavioral 
therapy. So BT, behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy says, hey, look, okay, so we're not just animals. Um, like we don't want to just look at behavior. We want to be going after the cognitive behavior. We want to be going after what it is that you're thinking, the thinking that leads to behavior. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy doesn't, like I said, I'm going to look at my notes, stay on track. Rather than focusing solely on behavior, CBT focuses on changing thoughts that are leading to the behaviors. Now, if you think about 2 Corinthians 10.5, you're like, oh, that's kind of a biblical concept, right? 2 Corinthians 10.5, take every thought captive to obey Christ. In other words, control your thoughts. Don't just let them run amok. You control your thoughts. So you're like, oh, that, okay, so CBT then, is that a biblical type of therapy? Well, I would say a couple things. There's lots that you could say, but this is what I would say. One, it depends on what thoughts and behaviors you deem to be bad and which ones you want to replace them with. That's the first thing. Second of all, who's deciding? Who's the authority on what thoughts you should have, what thoughts you shouldn't have? But third and most significantly, CBT doesn't address the heart. It doesn't address why you're thinking this way, nor does it attempt to realign your affections, your desires, on glorifying God or your purpose for living according to God. Let me say that again. CBT doesn't address the heart. It doesn't address why you're thinking this way, nor does it attempt to realign your affections on glorifying God, which is your purpose for living. Listen carefully <coughs> to this next part, because I don't want to be misunderstood. At its foundation, CBT is rooted in naturalism and is devoid of God at its root. So although the techniques of changing our thinking may be legitimately helpful even for the Christian, changing your thinking so that you don't experience suffering is not the ultimate goal, biblically. We are to take every thought captive, but finish the verse. In obedience to Christ, to obey Christ. Take every thought captive to obey Christ. Christ. The point of the Christian life, you've heard me say this, is not to not sin. The point of the Christian life is not to stop suffering. It's not simply to eliminate bad thoughts and bad feelings and bad behavior. The point of the Christian life is to live for the glory of God. So CBT is really, really closely aligned, is probably of all the things we're going to say is most closely aligned or has the most overlap with Christianity, but there's still ways that we can say that it comes up short. Okay? And that's pretty true for a lot of these different things. There's kernels of truth in them. Even with Freud, hey, there's something inside you that's making you do, that like is, is driving you to do what you do. Well, we would call it the heart. He just made up the unconscious. He just made it up. So there's kernels of truth to these, but I just want to at least say that CBT would fit in this behavioral category. Okay? Now, third category. You're like, man, we're never going to get through this chart, right? <laughs> okay, third category, though. This is humanistic psychology. So in, oh, I had another example. Can I go back to the CBT? I just, I almost breezed right by it in my notes. I had an example of Philippians 4. So like if you're anxious, um, Philippians 4 talks about the true solution to your fear, to your anxieties is rejoicing in the Lord, trusting in God, trusting in his word, relying on the Holy Spirit, attempting to glorify God. And it doesn't say all those words, but if you take it in context of what he's saying there, then that's when the God of peace is with you. In other words, it's not just don't think about the, good, the bad things, think about the good things. It's talking about just realigning all of who you are and thinking about what you have in Christ and realigning your affections to the Lord. So it's not just quit thinking about that. That's making you anxious. Let's think about this. Um, it's, it's doing it, pointing you towards the Lord. All right, but moving along, humanistic psychology on your notes or in the chart, it says positive potential. Those could be synonyms for what we're talking about tonight. Abraham Maslow, Carl Rogers, uh, from Maurer. Um, Maurer's the group setting guy. He always, you know, wanted people to, to get their help in the group setting. And uh, this is another, another way to, to refer to this. If you're taking notes especially, you can write at the top third force psychology. Sometimes you'll hear that, third force. The reason why they call it third force psychology is because one, it rejects Freud, the first column. It rejects Freud because they thought he had an imbalanced focus on the individual. It rejects the second column, the second guys, because it gives the environment too much power. And so then where does the power lie? It's, it's not just on... The, the outside that it's shaped the individual. It's not just on the, in the environment. According to the third wave of psychology, where does it lie? It lies 
within you. That's where the power lies. Check this out. Here's a quote from From. Man's first act. One second. I have something else that didn't make it on the screen. Okay, I'm going to read it and then I'll come to that. The Christian interpretation of the story of man's act of disobedience as his fall has obscured the clear meaning of the story. Okay, tell me more. All right, so he's talking about the Garden of Eden, right? Let me say it again since it's not on the screen. Don't try to follow along. It's not up there yet, okay? You guys, let me go back. Quit looking at the screen. Okay. (laughs) The Christian interpretation of the story of man's act of disobedience as his fall in Genesis 3 has obscured the the clear meaning of the story. The biblical text does not even mention the word sin. True or false? False. True. It doesn't say sin. Well, you get to Romans 5.12, it calls it sin. (laughs) Come on, you you can read the fall of man and you don't have to read the word sin to know that this was not good. (laughs) They came short of the mark of what God wanted from them, right? All right, so he's right though. It doesn't, it didn't mention the word sin. He goes on to say, man challenges the supreme power of God and he is able to challenge it because he is potentially God. Here it is, now on the screen. Man's first act is rebellion and God punishes him because he has rebelled and because God wants to preserve his supremacy, God has to protect his supremacy by an act of force, by expelling Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden and by thus preventing them from taking the second step towards becoming God, eating from the tree of life. Man has to yield to God's superior force, but he does not need to express regret or repentance. It's like, I was thinking like your older brother may get his way because he's stronger. It doesn't mean you have to love him. Like, well, it's an amazing statement that he says there. You don't need to express regret or repentance. Having been expelled from the Garden of Eden, he begins his independent life. His first act of disobedience is the beginning of human history because it's the beginning of freedom. Really interesting. All right, so this is the guy that is teaching us psychology. So that's from, um, still in that same category, Maslow. So he rejected the scientific method. He very much emphasized experience. He has a major focus on self. You've heard these terms, self-actualization, which requires, what's the pyramid? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Self-actualization is what he's after. In other words, you know, there's when people say that like my love tank is not full. That's, that's from the hierarchy of needs. You need to do something for me, for me to be self-actualized, to, for me to reach my full potential. You need to do certain things. If you don't do certain things for me, I will not reach my full potential. Now, he's, he had motivation as the key. Your motivation for all that you do should be to reach your full potential But I would ask, for whose sake? Full potential, well, it's for me, for my sake. I want to be the best me that I can be. I want to be comfortable in my skin, all that kind of stuff. Now, later Maslow added at the very top of the pyramid, he added transcendence. Transcendence is where you achieve connection to divine power, he said. And, which is ironic, that you actually reach selflessness. So, as long as you are literally full of yourself, I'm not, (laughs) that's like self-actualization. Like you're getting everything that you want. As long as you do that, you get to the point of self-actualization, right? You have the lower needs, but then you have the other needs of like, you need to love me. Now this is, this becomes really, really common when you have secular counseling for a husband and a wife. You need to do this for them. And if she's not giving you that, or if he's not giving you that, then you're, Th- what, what are they saying with those needs? Hierarchy of needs. And the goal is self-actualization. You're the best you. Now they'll say, or he says, when you get to that point, then you're comfortable in your own skin. You're comfortable you being you, all that kind of stuff. And they say, then you reach transcendence. It's at that point that you start to have peace. And it's at that point that you really do become selfless, they say. Because now you're comfortable being you. And now I don't need you anymore. Now I can just be me and I can love you. That's <coughs> what it teaches. So as long as you're self-actualized, then you'll be at peace. Then you'll be able to love other people, serve other people, make a difference in society, etc. So that's Maslow. Rogers talked a lot about the ideal self, self-image, self-esteem, how self-love 
um, is determined by your relationship with your parents. And I don't know if I'm really going to step on toes on this, but uh, a lot of Dr. Dobson's teaching is rooted in this category, humanistic psychology. It's mixed with biblical concepts, but a lot of his teaching, which, you know, at least for me, growing up with, you know, my parents and raising kids and stuff like that. So, I don't know, maybe in your 70s, 60s, 70s, for those of you are there, you, know, you would have been, this would have been all over. Um, you wouldn't have seen it outright. But this is the psychology that's making its way in there. And this is, we have a whole session on self-esteem, right? Self-love, all that. It's all from this. So this branch, we're still in that third column, has a major emphasis on free will, your choices, because you're pursuing purposes as you decide, as you believe that you need due to self-actualization. Okay, so that's that. Then the next column is new age. Whoops, too high. Okay, so new age is that last column before we talk about God's way. Um, I like how it's just talking about the leader and it just says God in that last column. You like that? But come back to the new age. The new age one is uh, Williamson and McLean. So there's a lot of people though. There's a lot of names. Um, surely McLean might be the most mainstream, but there's a lot of other names, uh, people that have influenced this particular new age movement. Marianne Williamson, that's Oprah's spiritual advisor, yeah. in case you cared. Um, Marilyn Ferguson, David Spanger, Alice Bailey, these different people wrote on these things. But anyone um, see Shirley MacLaine or read her book, Out on a Limb, or her little her movie series or TV series, uh, Out on a Limb. So she has this scene where she's out on the beach. You can look at it. Shirley MacLaine, Out on a Limb. Just look on YouTube and just, just Google, I am God. So she's on the beach and um, this guy, I don't remember the guy's name anymore, but she's got her arms out and she's supposed to yell out, I am God. I am God. I am God. And the more you say it, the more it becomes true, the more you believe it. So what is happening with this particular wave of thinking, this psychology, is it's blurring the lines between different religions. It's syncretistic. It's all spiritual paths all lead to the same place. Some people have summarized this view by saying the new age includes any belief that stands outside of normal religion. So they pride themselves in not being religious, but being spiritual. So you're like, I don't know, is this, is this in our, is this in our world today? Okay, They're ready for this? They talk a lot about energy healing. It's like when you see the person over the other person, but they're not touching them. They're just like almost a massage. That'd be like such a tease. Um, okay, energy healing, astrology, reincarnation, karma, spirituality, not religion, mindfulness, God is within you. Your truth, my truth, but no absolute truth. This is like the, yeah, like we're, we're all, we are all one. It's like the coexist bumper, bumper sticker. Now, I don't know why everyone, like what they believe when they slap it on their car, but, but it's that kind of thing to, we're not just like, hey, can we all just get along? But more like it doesn't make a difference. We are all one. Everything is all the same and all roads lead to the same place. God is everywhere. God is out there. God is in me. God is in you. The different practices that you would see with these kinds of things are meditation, but not biblical meditation where you're filling your mind with scripture, but like trance-like meditation, yoga, acupuncture, tarot cards, grounding. I remember walking Mount Tamil Pius and the guy was walking barefoot the whole way on the, on the hike, but that was to ground himself. Um, to become more one with the earth and uh, visual visualization, chanting mantras to make it true. So these are all staunchly anti-Protestant. They believe that's dogma from without. They don't want that. Instead, they teach that truth is all around you and it's in everything. That's mon monism. Everything is, God is in everything. Now, what's key for them is the individual is the highest authority in spiritual matters. The individual is preeminent. That should bring your mind back to Colossians. So you don't need the church, right? Sound like the hippie movement to you? It came out in the 70s and 80s, so it's like on the back end uh, of, well, in the hippie movement. And so, so like, do we just, we all just, just become one with the earth. By the way, if we're all one with the earth, you better protect the earth. You better save the earth because you're going to be reincarnated. You're going to somehow, it's coming back, karma. You understand that? All of a sudden you're like, whoa, there's a lot of talk about saving the earth. Not as being a good steward. You're going to say something? Yeah. Quick question. Yeah. Quick question. 
Yeah. <clears throat> in Judaism as well as Unitarianism, mm -hmm. would those kind of fall to an extent into that quote unquote religious from a religious standpoint? Yeah, probably. You, yeah, I think so. Now, I, my hesitation is going back to where it originated, Unitarianism, for example. But I think a lot of people would be attracted to Unitarianism for, for this particular reason. Um, and but Kabbalah is the same mm -hmm. as far as nature and, mm -hmm. you know, God is in the trees and God is in us and mm -hmm. God is in everything. Yeah. Yeah, now a lot of this is, um, this. I you can re do a lot of research on your own on this, but a lot of this is when we actually had some political things that allowed the, the Eastern religions to be able to uh, immigrate here. So all of a sudden we have I Eastern religions that are, that are here, major influence. So again, this is, I I'm trying to just stay high level. Those are the four categories. And then you have the leader of, of, <laughs> of, of God's way is God. Um, okay, so now we're going to start moving through the, the, uh, the chart. All right. So that was all set up. So I'll go faster now. I need to go faster. So what is their anthropology? That's it says man on the left hand side. Well, Freud in the instinctual category is says you're driven by instincts. It's your unconscious. The behavioral say what it, um, what is man? Man is a conditioned animal. Not all of them believe it that strongly is. Um, but generally speaking, they would believe that you're just a conditioned animal. The humanistic psychology or positive potential believes that man is intrinsically good and has potential within. And the New Age movement thinks that I'm divine, that I'm God. Now, God's way, what does God think of man? God is created by God to glorify God. We are his creatures. That's what God would believe, or that's what God teaches in his word. Now, what about their hamartiology? Um, the, problem, the next three categories would be um, related to sin. But what do they believe is the problem of mankind? First, the problem defined in this category as we move from left to right. The instinctual category believes there is an internal conflict that you have. The problem from the behavioral perspective is you have environmental failure, your parents, your whatever, your environment, where you grew up, middle class, all that kind of stuff, poor class, all that. So in the positive potential says that the problem is that your mind is just blocked and very similar with new age. You just have a blocked mind. Now, God's says that the problem is very clearly sin. Your problem, depravity of man. You're a sinner. You're a sinner who cannot do anything but sin unless God intervenes. Who is responsible for this problem? The responsibility from Freud's perspective is other people. You're not responsible for your internal conflict. Behavioral people say it's in your environment and it's that your environment failed. Positive potential is your negative thinking that's responsible for this mind block. You're not, you shouldn't be anxious. It's just your own, it's your negative thinking that's leading to this. And the new age believes it's your limited thinking or your lack of enlightenment or you, you think too little of yourself. That could fit for multiple categories. God's view of the responsibility is you. You have problems because of you. Or if you're helping someone else, it's the individual. You choose to sin. They choose to sin. That's who's responsible. I'm hoping you're seeing that there's a, that's the reason why there's a darker line on the screen and a really dark line in your notes because God's way is at contrast at, um, compared to all the others. Now we get to guilt. What about guilt? Is it real? Is it not? Freud would say it's a result of imposed standards from others. The behavioral camp would say it's not important. You're just an animal. There's really no evils. The positive potential camp would say it's not important or it's even rejected. And the new age rejects it because it hinders your spiritual advancement. So reject your guilt. You're God. God shouldn't be guilty. What does God have to be guilty about? Reject it. It's not real. You shouldn't have it. God's way, your guilt is real. Your guilt is a result of sin. You are justifiably guilty. Now, what about soteriology? The, pro the solution to the problem. How is one saved, both salvation and sanctification? The cure. Freud says the cure is self-awareness. You need to tap into your unconscious. Behavioral camp says you need to restructure your environment. And a lot of times this happens, you'll see it where children will cut out their parents from their life. After all, the counsel that they're receiving is that they were the problem. Positive potential or humanistic psychology would believe that the cure is to release potential within yourself. Like we said, self-actualization. The New Age movement would say that you need to focus on feelings to find your inner solution. 
God says the way is you need to repent and believe. Believe in the gospel. You will only be made right. Justification. Only be made right with God by faith in Christ. And then, once you're saved, you will grow by grace in Christ. You need the Holy Spirit inside you. That's the cure. Put your sin away and turn to Christ. The counseling technique, psychoanalysis for Freud, hypnosis, personality testing, it's making a comeback, and analysis. Behavioral, you have manipulation of behavior. You just change the environment, right? Train someone to respond to reward and to punishment. Restructure your environment, which some of that can be biblical. It is biblical, but that's their counseling technique. Humanistic psychology, that third column, the way that the the counseling technique there is reflection of thoughts and feelings. I can't remember what movie it was, but maybe it's, if I remember it, probably wouldn't want to name it anyways. But anyways, I think it was Robert De Niro. He's like, he's, he's got a, like some psychologist and he's like, he asks him a question and then he repeats it back. He's like, you call yourself a doctor? I tell you my problem. You just repeat it right back to me. I don't remember. Anyone remember what that's from? Analyze this. Analyze this? Oh, I haven't seen, uh, yeah, maybe I shouldn't, I don't know how good the movie is, probably not worth mentioning on here, but anyways, <laughs> that is the reflective, why do they reflect back? Why do they get you to answer all the questions in this category? What's that? <laughs> not, not because they don't know. Um, they might know, but they don't have the answer. What category are we in? We're in positive potential. You have the answer inside of you. So I am the one that's going to help you find the answer in you. So you ask me a question, I'm so scared. Why do you think you're so scared? You know, and so I'm going back. And it's the reason why they're doing that particular counseling technique is not because just period, or just that they're good at asking questions, is because they actually believe that the answer to the problem is inside of you when you reach this positive potential. You reach the full you. So they want positive thinking, but it's all relative to you. All right, and then the new age, uh, the counseling technique, you want to help them discover their inner guide, euphoria through various techniques, breathing, repeated mantras, like I said, grounding, and they get very creative. Um, essential oils and all that kind of stuff. So did I step on some toes there? You guys have, es so essential oils, there's a lot going on with essential oils in the <laughs> sense of this category. <laughs> it's not sinful to... Put oil on yourself, all right? <laughs> all right. Or what do you do with them? Candle? What do you, yeah. What's that? Oh, counselee. I'm sorry. So, uh, yeah, it says C. Counselee provides all their answers. That's what I was, that's what I paused on. <coughs> counselee. Sorry, I should have explained that. All right. So the counseling technique by from God's way is that you would listen that you would use the word of God. So I want to hear what's going on in your life. I want to use the word of God and I want to teach and I want to convict and I want to correct and I want to train you and I want to restore you back and bring you to maturity in Christ, bring you back in this relationship with the Lord. You're going this way. I want to help you go this way to the Lord. The answer is not inside you. The answer is outside of you. Let's get you back going to the Lord. That's the counselor's technique. And then lastly, this one. Oh yeah, before I go there. Did I say I will convict? <clears throat> yeah, thank you. So I don't mean that like, yeah, because we said it in whatever lesson that was, that I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm not the one that's going to bring conviction. So let me read it. Thank you, Phelan. Use the word to teach, <coughs> to convict, and to correct and train. Yeah, it's the Holy Spirit through the wor word of God that brings conviction. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Um, okay, the last one here on the counseling focus. Just, I'll read them quick. Liberate self, improve self, elevate self, release self, in God's way, deny yourself. That's the, like, the clearest one out of all of them. God's way versus man's way. More of me, more of me, more of me, more of me, less of me, more of God. That's the last category. Let me remind you, Colossians 2.8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition and according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. So sometimes people will assume that what we're saying then is, so like all you biblical counselors, you just hate psychology, right? It's all bad. 
I would say that the simple answer to this, <coughs> oh, I didn't even put it on there. Here we go. This is how I would answer that question. Do you guys just hate psychology? This is the easiest way. I don't think this is in your notes. Nope. It's not? Nope. I'll leave it on there. Our problem with psychology is not when they tell us what people do given certain conditions or situations. It's when they tell us why we have problems and how to fix them. There can be some really helpful observations that secular counselors, secular psychologists make, <coughs> such as when is a woman most likely to enter in the most severe part of postpartum depression? What are the contributing factors to just circumstantial that would lead to that? Um, suicidal ideation. How, like, what can we do with someone who is thinking about that? There's, there are things that the, the secular world can provide when it comes to their observation about symptoms and these types of things. But it's when they, they're, when they take that information, they're placing it into a context that is an entirely antithetical worldview to Christianity. So that's why we say it's, it's when they tell us why we have a problem and then how to fix it. Their observations are great, but they place them in a context that is antithetical to Scripture. So, do other models, other counseling models, genuinely care? Yes, they do. Do they ask good questions? Yes, they do. Do they often know how to draw people out? Yes. Are they compassionate? Oftentimes, yes. Do they have personal faith in Christ? Maybe. I'm not questioning their salvation. Do they make good observations? Yes. Do they help people? It depends. I will leave that with you. What do you mean by help? Now, some of you are like, I was helped. What do you mean by helped? Don't answer it out loud. I'm just, what do you mean by help? So I am fully aware that there are a lot of people that have given their lives to helping other people. And I'm saying that their methodology is unbiblical. Their philosophy is unbiblical at its root, at its core. To use biblical language, it is self-made religion. It is man-made philosophies. Now, just to give you a little breather, I thought I'd quote Whitney Houston for you. Okay? I'm not going to sing it. And so it's the greatest love of all. You guys know that song? Yeah. yeah. I've been sorry long ago. I'm not going to sing the whole thing, but okay. So here's the chorus. Ready? This is just, just for fun. So she says, I decided long ago never to walk in anyone's shadows. If I fail, if I succeed, at least I'll live as I believe. No matter what they take from me, they can't take away my dignity because the greatest love of all is happening to me. I found the greatest love of all inside of me. The greatest love of all is easy to achieve. Learning to love yourself is the greatest love of all. There you go. She hook, line, and sinker with all this stuff. And it makes me sad. On the one hand, you're like, what are you talking about? On the other hand, it's like, man, if, if the Lord didn't intervene in my life and open up my eyes, I wouldn't. I'd be in the same spot. <coughs> so far be it from us to look down our nose on them when, when we did nothing to open up our eyes. The Lord had to do that and to show us. So to summarize, man's way is to exalt self. It's that simple. God's way is to deny self. So you're wondering, probably, is there middle ground? Can we take from both? And there is a camp that tries to do that, and that is called Christian counseling, or sometimes integrated counseling, or Christian psychology. Okay? Now, <coughs> I am going to try to explain this as fast as I can. So I do this in our membership class um, every single time. So there's, let's start with this. The Bible draws a distinction between biblical counseling and secular counseling, saying, on a fundamental level, no, you can't. Now, in your manual, page 70 and 72, you don't have to turn there, but it gives tons of scriptural support for this. But there is a counseling model that says, ah, it's not like quite like this. We can grab from both. I don't mean grab their observations. I mean, we can take the truths of psychology, and we can take the truths of God's word, and we can bring them together. And they, they'll say, like, as long as it's not contradictory to the word of God. Now, let me walk through that, though. So, <clears throat> because a lot of people, and especially those of you in the room that have been to any type of secular counseling or Christian counseling or Christian psychology, this is probably going to be helpful for you, and you're going to be thinking about it in your own experience, and that's totally fine. That's what I want you to do. 
So some people would say it's really a spectrum. You got biblical counseling. Let me do it right. Biblical counseling on the left. You got biblical counseling over here. And then you have secular counseling that's way over here. So what we want to do is we want to pull from both. Now, we talked about the sufficiency of Scripture, though, right? If someone is pulling from both, do they believe in the sufficiency of Scripture? No. Why not? Because they're going outside of it, right? So, so there's <coughs> Christian counseling, though, is try, s- will say that like we're going to pull from both. All right. The problem is if you're a Christian counselor or a secular counselor, you do not believe in the sufficiency of Scripture, Remember, it's either sufficient or it's not. It's not like there's no sliding scale of sufficiency. Like, I'm almost pregnant. <laughs> you are or you're not, right? So, okay, so there's sufficient. That's just the nature of the word. So biblical counseling believes the Bible is sufficient. Every other model believes that it is not. All right. Secular counseling believes the Bible is not important and not necessary. You guys agree? You with me? Yeah. They don't, secular counseling. I'm not talking about their personal faith. I'm talking about that the Bible is not important and not necessary to help you with your problems. Christian counseling believes that the Bible is important. They will say that. Yet secular theories must be utilized. If you truly want to care for the other person, you must use secular theories. Okay? If you're going to take a picture of the slide, this is fully built. There you go. That's all of it. Christian or biblical counseling says the Bible is important and the Bible is necessary. So this is why I think this particular chart is helpful because you can clearly see that only one camp believes that the Bible is sufficient. Everyone else believes that it's insufficient, but there is a sliding scale here based on secular counseling in in, or the Christian counselor who's willing to slide along the scale. You might have a Christian counselor who's more biblical, uses more Bible, prays more often, uses more biblical terms, than somebody else. You might have someone who says they're a Christian counselor, but in their technique and everything, there's almost nothing biblical about it. Your counseling conversation just didn't go there. Some of the counselors themselves are very willing to slide along that. If I went to a Christian counselor and I said I'm a pastor, guess what? They're going to be like, all right, well, let me start using, let me slide this way to help this guy. And you come in there, I'm not making this up. You come in there and you say to the Christian counselor, I don't care about God. Like, no big deal. I mean, they might disagree with you, but they're going to slide their way back this way and they're not going to, they're going to just be using more secular ways of helping you. That you might go to a Christian counselor's office, like multiple people there, and you might have one Christian counselor who's way on that side and the next counselor who's way on this side. Okay, but anecdotally, in our counseling ministry here, the people that come from Christian counselors typically find people way over on, like their previous experience was way over here. I like to say that they gave secular counseling with a Christian accent. <laughs> they're, they're using biblical phrases or they're going to the word to support their different theories. Like you need this from your husband, wife, you need to get this or whatever, your needs. And they'll talk about the benefit of these needs and they'll use a biblical verse as their stamp of approval on it. So they're not going to the word to talk about what the word says. They're using the word of God to give some authority to the secular counseling principle. But that is the camp of Christian counselors. Now, this is, I'm going to dive in seven minutes. Let's see if I can do this. And then I want to save some time at the end for the biblical counseling. What are the reasons that they give? These aren't all the reasons, but what are some of the reasons that Christian counselors give to integrate counseling, to integrate biblical counseling, or the Bible, I should say, with secular counseling. They'll say things like, all truth is God's truth. That's a really common phrase. And so they will say, because of God's common grace and general revelation, God's, they, I'll explain it in a minute, but they'll say God revealed and, and put truth out there. And because it, if it actually is true, it's proven to work, then it's God's truth. If all truth is God's truth, then it's totally fair. It doesn't, it's out there for mankind to find. So the question though, that we're going to get to in just a second is what aspects of truth has God revealed and to whom? So hang on to that. Another reason they'll give is, hey, the Bible doesn't really speak to many areas that concern psychologists. The Bible doesn't speak to things like ADHD, PPD, OCPD, like they, right? The, the, there's all kinds of different things. It seems like all of them have acronyms these days, but the, all these different things that like, hey, they're, they're just not in the Bible. 
So it's not that I don't like the Bible. It's just they have studied a lot and really looked at different things that are just not in Scripture. Okay, that's what they say. But all you have to do is read the DSM and look at all the different um, descriptions in there, the, the symptoms. You're like, I don't care how you group them. All these symptoms are in Scripture. Scripture speaks to these things. Again, I'm not talking about a medical issue. I'm talking about a spiritual issue, okay? So if someone has a hyperthyroid, for example, or hypothyroid, either one, it's going to affect different things that you do. Now, even if you sin, even because of that, it doesn't mean that it excuses you from making things right and responding biblically to your sin that you just committed, but there is still a medical component that you probably ought to go get checked out. Sometimes people don't know that they have it. That's why we say we're not anti-medicine. You can go do that. You can go find, and, and it's helpful. One of the good things a counselor will do is say, go, have you, when was the last time you got a checkup? And go to the doctor, and that's fine. Now, does our society over-medicate? Yes, it's even recognized in the medical world. And they want to, they want to, even in the secular society, they will pair it with therapy, some type of therapy, because they recognize that meds alone is not going to solve the problem. So you can't fix an inner man problem, a spiritual problem with medication. Okay, I hope you understand that. So the third one here is um, another reason given is that they're extremely intelligent professionals who have given their lives to helping others. Well, I don't deny that at all. I just don't think that's a valid reason to integrate. All right, ready? Quickly in the deep end. Two views on general and special revelation. The argument, as I understand it, is moving towards common grace, but we can, I think this will still be helpful for you to, to think this through. The, the, if you understand general and special revelation, it's going to directly answer number one that they gave, and it's going to indirectly answer number two and three. So if you felt like this class is a little bit like drinking from a fire hose, then I'm going to spray you for a second. So, okay, a biblical understanding of general and special revelation. General revelation is God's revelation of himself to all people through general means, namely nature. Okay? So biblically, general revelation is God's revelation of himself. There's a reason why that's a blank. To all people. Psalm 91, the heavens declare what? The glory of God. The glory of God. Romans 1 talks about how truth is evident to all, but men suppress the truth. This category <coughs> is intended to convey how God revealed to all people through nature that he's a merciful, all-powerful creator and that man is a sinful created being that stands guilty before him. It is sufficient to condemn, but not to save. Here's the passage on this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them. Do you notice that? For what is known, finish it, what is known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his external power, his divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Okay, that's general revelation. Special revelation is God's revelation of specific truths to specific people through supernatural means, like the Bible. It includes additional truths, if you will, about God and how to be reconciled, okay? Specific truths to specific people. This category is intended to convey how and where God revealed the way man can be restored to a right relationship with their creator and experience all that he was created to be, namely through the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is sufficient to save and to sanctify, but only if it, that is the gospel, is known and embraced. So long ago, and many times in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. That's the Old Testament. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. We could call that the New Testament. That's God's special revelation. All right, this is where the rubber starts to meet the road here should be number two. How does an integrationist understanding of general revelation differ? Well, some integrationists, perhaps not all, but a lot of them, will say that general revelation does not refer to God's revelation of himself to all people through nature, but rather God's revelation of general truths to all people through nature. 
So what they're doing is saying, this is what I want general revelation to mean. Not what do the passages say, but this is what I think God does, is God just reveals general truths to all people in nature. So it's not God revealing himself to all people without distinction. They're saying it refers to God-given truths that reside in nature, able to be discovered by any man, saved or unsaved. Therefore, these truths, including how the brain works, how neurons work, our inner sense of right and wrong, why we experience guilt, what must be done to overcome these problems, etc., that can be obtained by anyone. <coughs> in other words, some integrationists will say that the secular world has the ability to discover God's divine revelation of how to live outside of his divinely revealed word. And that term divine revelation is key because with divine revelation comes what? Authority. If you can say that it's out there to be found by all mankind, and that's what God did, then it comes and it's, uh, it's God's truth, then it is authoritative. So they say as long as it doesn't contradict, Christian counselors say as long as it doesn't contradict scripture, God put it out there for everyone to go find. So therefore all truth is God's truth, why would, like, these people are schooled and intelligent and they've done all this. Let them go find it. It's God's truth. The only problem is that's not what general revelation is. You read scripture, God's revealing himself to mankind. But they all say, well, this is where psychology falls. And when man finds it, it gets a stamp of authoritative truth because it falls within this theological category. And as long as general revelation is defined this way, then man's discoveries do not have to measure up or yeah, do not have to measure up to God's clearly revealed standard in the word of God because all truth is God's truth. So it's okay that they oppose each other or they would say they complement each other. The Bible doesn't speak to that. So let's go to with his, what he's revealed in nature as authoritative. Now let me back up a second because I may have lost some of you. Just summarize. Christian counselors say that all truth is God's truth. So let's take from the world what God has revealed, and let's take, which is general truths about facts and nature, and let's use it alongside the word of God. The only problem is, in Romans especially, God revealed himself in nature. What did he say? You're a guilty sinner. You have no excuse for what you're doing. Your conscience condemns you, and you know that you're wrong. God revealed the solution. Salvation and sanctification is found in Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins, turn to him. It's revealed in the word of God. With man's wisdom versus God's, it's not both and, it's one over the other. Again, I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm not saying they don't love the Lord. They don't love the word. They don't love people. I'm talking about an entirely different worldview. All right. That was two of the three. Biblical counseling. Now, this whole class is about biblical counseling. But let me mention a couple things here. A brief... Biblical defense for refusing to integrate. Remember, your manual has a lot more than what I'm about to give you. But here, the first one we can see is what fellowship has light with darkness? Second Corinthians 6, what fellowship has light with darkness? <coughs> it says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Well, that's exactly what Christian counseling is doing. What partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. In that same category there, it's not in your notes, but jot down 1 Corinthians 1 through 3. 1 Corinthians 1 through 3, like as in chapter 1 through 3, you read through those three chapters and see if Paul thinks that you should integrate man's wisdom. The answer is no. Okay, that's the short version. But go read it, especially if this is a struggle to you. See what the word of God has to say there. All right, so what fellowship has light with darkness? Number two, the church has been warned about people that will swerve from the truth swerve from the truth. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, Paul said, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, the doctrine, some have made shipwreck of their faith. 
Number three, another reason why we would refuse to integrate is because the Holy Spirit is necessary for lasting biblical change. The Holy Spirit, this is kind of an obvious statement, was not part of any of the secular psychology theories, right? But we say it's necessary for lasting biblical change. The Holy Spirit speaks to us through the word. You guys remember the new covenant? We looked at that in Ezekiel 36. You will not change, God says, unless I come and I put my spirit inside you to make you obey my statutes and my rules. I will make you be my people. Philippians 2, 12 to 13, work out your salvation. It talks about it there. Because it is God who has at work both to will, the heart, the will, and to work for his good pleasure. Secular psychology obviously rejects the work of the Spirit. Number four, the church is responsible to counsel each other. This is what I was hoping to save some time on. I'm still going to have to be brief. But this is why at our church, we, we really don't want people to think that we have a biblical counseling ministry, period. Like, if you need help, you go to the biblical counseling ministry. Rather, we believe that the Bible teaches that biblical counseling ought to be the culture of the church. It ought to be what every believer does, though maybe not formally for everybody. But this is what God calls you to do. Now, let me see if I can prove that. But though I'm going to work my way there. You doing it is, is letter C. But I want to start with the pastors because there are many churches and well i'll just say there are many churches that just farm it out they just refer out for a variety of reasons sometimes i just can't do it sometimes because they don't have a conviction that they should be doing it sometimes it's just because they don't know how to do it but the very fact that they're referring out and sometimes they're referring well who are you going to refer out to if they refer out to another church that does biblical counseling okay great but if you're referring out what God has charged, if God has charged the pastors to care for the flock of God and they're referring them out to people that are teaching something different than what they're teaching in the pulpit, what are you doing? You, you want them to work against you? What's happening here? So pastors, it says in Ephesians 4, are called to, to shepherd or care for the flock of God. They're, in Ephesians 4.12 specifically, responsible to bring the church to maturity. So pastors are definitely called to care for the flock of God, to counsel biblically, if you will. Elders, which is the same office, but different term used. 1 Peter 5 talks about the elders are to shepherd the flock of God. In Acts 20, it's a great passage there. Um, Paul says, the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, rather than just overseers, make sure we don't run out of money, but overseers to care for the church, the flock of God. And then Paul, in his, as he's walking through with the Ephesian elders and Acts 20, he's talking about, look, I didn't cease to go from house to house, we call private ministry of the word, or to publicly preach. It's like he's the same guy from the pulpit, same guy in the living room or whatever they had back then. That's what he's talking about, that, that his job, and he was con conveying that to the other elders, your job is to care for the flock of God. Now go do it. Now, thirdly though, every Christian is responsible to counsel one another. For this, I want to show you in the word. So go to 1 Thessalonians 5. It doesn't matter how long you've been walking with the Lord. It doesn't matter how well you know your Bible. None of those caveats are given here. But check this out. 1 Thessalonians 5. In verse 12, what I want you to think through as I read these is what group of people is being spoken about here, okay? So I'll help you out. First Thessalonians 5, 12. We ask you, brothers, he's writing to the church of Thessalonica. So who are the brothers? Is it the leaders? Is it not? We don't know yet. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Okay. So now we know, who are the brothers? Not the elders. Look carefully. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord. The yeah, it's the non-leaders. We could read it this way, right? This would make sense. We ask you, non-leaders, to respect the leaders who labor among you and who are over you in the Lord, who have authority in that, that position of pastor or elder and admonish you, okay? So we're asking you, just your average non-leader, to respect them. All right, 
So that's important because we understand the brothers, who the brothers are. And then it says in verse 14, and we urge you brothers, it's not talking about the pastors. It's talking about, we urge you brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. Now, <clears throat> what do we like to do? When someone comes to us with a big problem and you like, go talk to the pastor. That's a really good question, right? You're like, just get this off my plate as fast as I can. But what he's saying here, like, hey, respect your, respect your leaders. But what I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, right? That term is used, brothers, and it can mean brothers, and, or it means brothers and sisters. In this particular case, a lot of times you'll have a footnote that'll even say that. So he's talking about brothers and sisters in the church. It is your job to admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. Now, it's your own homework assignment to go back and go look at Colossians 3.16, Galatians 6.1, Hebrews 3, Romans 15.14. All those are talking about the same thing, that it is your job as a believer at your church, whether you have a formal ministry or not, to provide counsel to other people that is biblical in nature. So you don't have to send someone to the expert. It's you. Now, all of a sudden, if you're like, wait, hold on. People are going to come to me like I barely know my Bible. That's why we're in a class like this. God has entrusted the care of his own people to his own people among us. And so you're like, well, I'm not equipped. Well, let's start becoming equipped to be able to handle the word of God. Now, I'm not saying that we all have the ability to walk in the same way with someone else. Some people are good at high level. Some people are like just kind of like handing out these uh, like anecdotal things, you know, like these platitudes to people and like they just kind of stay on that level. Like I can just kind of give you my experience and that's it. But I, I think the call for everybody is to hear the other person, what's going on in your life. And you're asking questions to draw the person out and say, okay, I'm not the hero, but I'm going to do my best to take you to the word of God. And I'm going to show you what God's word has to say about it. Because it's our conviction that it is the word of God through the Holy Spirit that brings that conviction, that brings about that change. Like we talked about as the Holy Spirit makes its way to all the fingers in the end of the glove. So our job as believers is to walk alongside other people and to point them to the word. We're going to sin in the process. I'm going to sin in the process as I help people because I'm a sinful person too. I have my own bias. I try not to, but I do. I don't understand perfectly. Most often, all of us are like so ready to teach. We don't even ask a follow-up question. That's not good. So there's a lot of work that we need to do to be able to help people. Now, all of a sudden, just even in your home, you are providing counsel already just in your context. You don't even have to have like your own kids. It just, it's just roommates. It's friends. It's all that. You are providing counsel. The question is whether or not it's biblical. And God calls every Christian to do this. All scripture is breathed out by God, right? Um, Oh, here's the church has been charged to preach the word. Here's the verse. All scripture has been breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, reproof, and for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. We talked about that, but check this out. Now the personal charge to Timothy. Now this is a pastor, but it really is for all of us. I charge you, Timothy, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. The time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but will have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers, philosophies, to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. So to close it out, what are the implications of a biblical view of counseling? Three things. Every believer is responsible to counsel, counsel one another using the Bible. Every believer must see themselves at a minimum as an informal biblical counselor. And number three, every believer is responsible to grow in their ability to use the Bible accurately. I'd even add, and effectively. Accurately and effectively.